Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with Morale Satar. Hi Morale. Hi Joanna, how are you? I'm great, it's good to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Morale is the CEO of BiblioCrunch and the creator of Barely Bear, a smart speaker within a cuddly toy. With a background in software development and several years developing digital initiatives at Time magazine, Morale is perfectly placed to talk about voice search for authors today, which is just a super topic. Um, so Morale, let's start. So what is voice search? Because some people might not know and why is it increasingly important? So voice search is speech recognition technology. It's based on natural language uh, called natural language processing. So the way it works is instead of typing in your commands, like typing in 40 words, you can actually say 150 words and get the results that you want. So Siri works with voice search, Alexa, Amazon's Alexa works with voice search, Microsoft Cortana, Google HomePod, they all work with voice search. Mm. So. Uh, when, I mean, many listeners, I presume, will be using voice search in some way. It, you know, what, give us some examples of how it's different with voice search to typing. To typing. So let's say for, if you're looking for a book, if you type it in on a browser, you would type in nonfiction 2018 whatever period that you're looking for. But if you're actually talking through your phone, you would say, hey, I'm looking for a book from the historical period of the 1500s, romance, historical, that, that's kind of what the main difference is. It's based on long tail phrases and mm. questions. So you're actually, it's basically like asking a question versus just typing in two or three keywords. And with, authors and with people who are optimizing for voice search, you have to get into the mind of, hey, who's looking for my content? What kind of questions would they ask somebody else? And what type of things would it re return? So right now, Amazon, we're so used to just optimizing just keywords and keyword phrases. But with voice search and natural language processing, you have to kind of think about let's say I'm looking for Michelle Obama's Becoming book. Say, hey Siri, can I buy Michelle Obama's uh, Becoming book? Or if I'm looking for a guide to New York City, I would say, hey Siri or hey Alexa, what is a great guide about New York around me? So you have to think about phrases and actual long tail keywords versus just the one, like the six to 10 keywords that we're used to putting in. Mm, which I think is such a big mindset shift for those of us. I mean, we're, you know, similar age, you know, having <laughs> not not been kids with the internet, but getting the internet, you know, and then developing our search for this typing market. I mean, I, I, I find it difficult to use voice search myself because I'm so fast with typing it. It actually feels longer for me to formulate a question. <laughs> well... It's also Alexa can be pretty, pretty frustrating sometimes because when you ask Alexa, I think I saw a study that said Alexa returns what the book's about 30% correctly. Mm. And that's, that's a big deal. So people are like publishers and authors are losing a lot of opportunities because of the poor search functions. So if I went and said, Hey Siri, Oh, I hope it doesn't launch right now. Hey Siri, who's who's join a pen? It's gonna launch your website, but then it's gonna show me your snippet that you put on your website, so it'll tell me exactly who you are. Mm. And just uh, you mentioned there, so I was at London Book Fair recently, and a report came out from Score Publishing, and Bradley has been on the show as well. Uh, it says New York Times best-selling authors and their publishers stand to lose as much as 17 million this year in book sales because of poor voice assistant search recognition. So that backs up exactly what you're what you're saying there. But let's just um, just backing up a, a little bit. Okay. So um, let's just. Can 
you give us an overview? So you've mentioned some of the main assistants like Siri and Alexa and everything, but what is the penetration? Like, are we talking only rich people in America have these devices or, you know, what, what, what does it look like? No, actually for voice search, um, a uh, report came out by Adobe about 50% of users by 2020 will be using voice search. So that's half the world. And this is not just the United States. This is like half the people in the world who have access. And a lot of it has to do, and depending on the country that you're in, the mobile adoption is different. Like in China, it's completely different than it is in the US because we're at base in China. We, we first started out with desktops, but I was reading a report on China. They started out with mobile only. It's not mobile first, they're mobile only. So a lot of the voice prompts are voice prompt first. So so 50% adoption in the world, which I think is a pretty, pretty incredible number. And a lot of these results that you get are not optimized. Um, they're not optimal. So if I didn't know the rules about how to get my book on Audible, before I had connected my Alexa to my Audible account, I said, hey, Alexa, find me Michelle Obama's Becoming. And she said, I can't find that book right now, which is a little, which is a little ridiculous because it's the number one bestseller on our Amazon and nonfiction in the United States. But what I went through the Amazon page, I figured out how to connect it. And then it said, oh, Michelle Obama's Becoming. It's not in your library. Would you like to purchase it? But you have to get the exact prompt right. It said, Alexa, read Becoming by Michelle Obama. And mm the phrases have to match exactly what the, t like it's the title and the author. Yeah, and I think, I mean, it gives us a good idea of how early, and I think this is important. I feel like we're early on. It is frustrating to use these voice assistants. Yeah. Um, like you say, you almost try something and then you have to try something else. But let's not forget that most of us do that with typing as well. Like we type something into Google and it doesn't quite return what we want. So we type something else, right? So that, right, is, right. I mean, I guess what we're saying is um, most most things are not optimized right now for voice search because we've just spent 20 years optimizing for typing. Yes. <laughs> so so would you say that, you know, some of these issues will resolve over time as, as more and more people are using it? I think the speakers will get smarter. And I originally used to call them smart speakers, but then I realized nobody understood what I was talking about. I was actually talking about smart speakers and someone was like, you mean people who are really good at speaking? And I said, no, smart speakers like Google Home, um, Amazon's Alexa. Well, it's uh, the Echo, but, isn't it? Because Alexa is yeah. the assistant, but the yeah, Echo Alexa's is the... Amazon Echo. But we're all just like the natural term is called Amazon's Alexa. And even though it's the Echo Dot and the different types of Echo devices that they have, the, the, that is actually the smart speaker. Yes, you're right. But um, it's, it's... So then I started calling them Amazon's... Alexa and um, Google, uh, Apple Siri voice assistant. So those are the assistants. So Cortana, Alexa, Siri are the name of the assistants for the devices that they actually belong to. Mm. But we mentioned the developing markets there. And what I find interesting is that the Android devices are much more used in other markets because of the price point. So right. um, Amazon did have a phone briefly, but then got rid of it. So realistically, if we're talking that search is on mobile, we're talking Android devices, Apple devices, and then, you know, other Microsoft devices right? right which right. I think is what's interesting because at the moment it feels like it just feels like Amazon's Alexa is everywhere but actually yeah. they don't have the mobile penetration through things like Google so do you feel like the Google HomePod or the Google search through the phone you know has a stronger I guess uh, marketplace elsewhere where Amazon is not so dominant it actually, so Amazon has the largest market share. It has about 41% market share for speakers in the United States and 31% globally. But if you look at Google, they've grown over 400% over the last five years. So they're actually the fastest growing. So, and they are actually on their Google support forums, they actually have, um, guides for these are the optimizations and that they're going to be using 
things like the featured snippet that mm. you have on your homepage to actually return results through voice search. Because the fundamental difference between voice between web browser search, mobile search, and um, searching through a smart speaker is if you type a query on a web page, if you're a top 10 result, you're in good shape. But if you're number nine and you're searching mobily, then you don't make it to the front page of a mobile device. Maybe you make it, maybe if it's a longer screen, you're like the fourth result. But for a smart speaker, if you're not the first result, then you're kind of nowhere. So you have to keep on saying next. Yeah, yeah. well, and it's interesting because uh, my husband has an Apple Watch and there's only room on that tiny screen for a few lines. So yes. there's not even a first page. It's like there's only one thing, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. But you've mentioned uh, the featured snippet. So let's right. get into that because every, all the authors listening are going, OK, so how do people find my book? How am I going to do a snippet? So what is a featured snippet and, and how can we do that? So if you So if you actually go to the Google support page, they... Um, it's basically based on your meta description, on how you set your meta description on each page. So of your like website I, that you yes, own. On your, yeah, okay. on your website. So let's say if you go to thecreativepen.com, your featured snippet says, and I pulled it as an example. I'm Joanna Penn, award nominated New York Times and USA bestselling author. Hey me. Mentioned, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> an award winning creative entrepreneur. But then I pulled. Then I Googled another well-known person and their snippet was, I had a chance to catch up with the blog's founder. I'll leave his name out and took the opportunity to find out what he's been up to. So it's not actually about his main blog. It's just the beginning of the post. Mm. So what a lot of authors do is when you're, you need to SEO optimize your whole blog. You need to individually come up with a description for each blog post on your blog, especially your homepage, and just summarize and like to see if you can condense it into one sentence on what your blog is about because that's what's going to show up on your smartphone. Like if I say, hey Siri, tell me about Joanna Penn, I'll actually do that right now. I'll say, hey Siri, who's Joanna Penn? Okay. I found this on the web for who is Joanna Penn. Take a look. Okay. So you are the top result. Yay. <laughs> and then, and then the snippet shows Joanna Penn is an award nominated New York times and USA today bestseller. So you basically have like 10, 10 sentences. So you want to make sure everything is condensed in your meta description that you set on your homepage. And you can do that through an SEO plugin um, if you're doing a blog post or you're writing about a specific topic, uh, you can actually set that. It's just basically one sentence, condense it as much as possible and set it on every blog post that you write, or at least on all the main pages or your homepage, because the homepage for most authors are what shows up in search results because they probably are the most traffic pages or their, their books page. Um, mm. like a lot of authors have the list of their books on their web pages. So, the, an example of a good meta description would be Joanna Penn, all of Joanna Penn's books and then list out the most popular ones. So if someone is searching mm -hmm. through mobile, then they kind of get that idea to give them an idea of who you are. And it's cool. Yeah, so, oh, so many things. So first of all, just for listeners, so uh, if people use WordPress, then the Yoast uh, plugin has this metadata snippet yeah. thing. So that's uh, one plugin. Um, and you've just reminded me to update my older pages because you're right, these older pages, like my books page, I probably haven't updated that snippet for 10 years. So I probably do need to update that. So people listening who have an older blog update those most common pages. But then um, the other thing is that y how likely, okay, so obviously if people are looking for me and they know my name, then searching for my name means they get me. But that's not what most of my traffic is. So for example, um, on the Creative Pen, a lot, you know, a common search is how do I self-publish a book? Right. So let's go to that kind of search or fiction or, or um, fiction authors. It might be, like you said at the beginning, um, you know, fi what, what is a historical romance set in the Regency period. Um, so how do we optimize for those questions so that we can be found when people don't know who we are? 
when people don't know who we are, how do we optimize? So we, I actually, what I found really helpful just for SEO purposes, browser SEO is having an FAQ page, mm. which lists out all the common queries that someone would ask and then share it. So let's say you don't know who you are, but you still want traffic. So the way SEO works is first you have to have good web rank. You have to have good rank. You have to be mobile optimized and you have to have fast, um, fast page speed. And there's tools that you can use to actually test those things. So those are the basics. So if you're, if the web is finding that you're not loading fast, um, you're not mobile optimized, you're going to be further, further, further mm -hmm. down. So those are the basic things that you need to fix first, right? Is first you need to SEO optimize your basic web page. And then once you've mastered that, and let's say you're searching for historical, let's, let me see an example, a history, a history of partition in South Asia, right? So if you're searching for that type of book, I would probably put in, in the meta description, um, exactly a summary of that instead of, in, in addition to the keywords. So the keywords actually help the discovery in Amazon and Google, but the actual sentence that summarizes it will be in your meta description. So you want to make clear that that's what the browser sees and that's when, when people return your search results see. So you should already have a higher ranking, but then you want to be able to also translate those keywords. And then there's tools that we can use and come up with phrases based on the keywords that you use for your book. So um, let's say, I'm just gonna use this, don't don't hate me for using this vampire, vampire fiction. Um, no, we love vampire fiction around here. <laughs> <laughs> what what is the best um, va what is the best vampire fiction novel? And it will probably say Twilight. That's what you would say. So, but on your actual page, you would put in the different keywords. Mm -hmm. But then, based on the different keywords, you should come up with phrases on your FAQ page to kind of guide the reader, and also in that little snippet that you have that what your book is about in a query form. So what is the best vampire fiction today? And then that's probably what a person is gonna search for when they're looking for vampire fiction. And then there's different tools. I actually made a list of them that you can use to actually work on your natural language search. So there is uh, keywords everywhere, which I really love. And then there is the Google Keyword Planner, which shows you the most popular, and I'm sure um, author use that frequently. Um, the Moz Mobile Checker, what you could do is you could look at your competition and see who's linking to them and what keywords are being used by them and then just kind of adapt them to your own. Mm, and of course, our, our friend Dave Chesson at KDP Rocket yeah. would be yes, yes, the, yes. the other one. Um, so. Uh, if people, again, I'm going to summarize what you're saying, because I know for some people, this might be a little bit technical, but actually, if what, if you control your own website, this is not that difficult. So I got from you there that I should go to each of my books, each of my book pages and go to my snippet in my metadata and update that per book page to yes. uh, to try and uh, respond to people's search. Now I haven't done that. I think I have, I don't even know if I've done the SEO on my book pages on my website. So I've got two, um, two actions so far out of this, which is fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, I think that a lot of authors listening are gonna go, okay, yeah, fair enough, but most people are not actually buying books on my website. They are buying books from Amazon, Kobo, Apple Books, they're buying an audiobook from Audible or Findaway or wherever, one of the many places you can buy books. So we have no control over the metadata on those sites. So are there any ways that, well, I, I say we don't, we can upload our descriptions and our keywords, but how can we optimize or help people find our books on those other platforms? So that's where content marketing comes in. 
and um, promotional images. So I'm sure a lot of listeners are familiar with the Stephen King Library. And the Stephen King Library is now available on Alexa, um, on the Echo devices, and it's also available on Google. But when I, my parents have a Google Home device, and my brother has a Google Home device, and we have a Alexa dot in our home. So when I was trying to search for it, I said, hey, Alexa, I'd like to listen to Stephen King. And I said, I don't know. I can't find what you're looking for. And then I said, how can that be? That's kind of strange. They just, and I said, maybe it's not available yet. And then when I went home to visit my parents, I said, hey, hey, Google, I'd like to listen to Stephen King. And it didn't really understand my prompt. And then finally I Googled and I said, how do I access the Stephen King library? And then the publisher, they actually created images that exactly tell you what the exact prompt should be. And if you don't use the exact prompt, it's not going to understand what you're saying. And the speaker won't understand how to get the book. So the exact prompt for Alexa, if you have Alexa devices, Alexa, open Stephen King library. That's it. And then, <laughs> Everyone's and then, Stephen King is now open. <laughs> yeah. And then it, then you hear his voice and he's telling you about his collection. I was like, oh, yes, I got it. This is awesome. And then the same thing with Google Home. It's, it's like, hey, Google, open Stephen King library. But they put on the publisher web page and all the blog posts about it. They actually have an image design that just displays that text. Mm. that says open the Stephen King library they have a full page dedicated just on how to access it so it's mostly educating the the readers on how to get your book so if you're if you're talking to somebody and I find a kind the complicated thing about uh, Amazon is that it won't actually search audible books unless you've actually connected audible to your actual device um, and Google Home actually doesn't let you purchase devices from Google Home. You have to purchase them on, you have to upload them to Google Play, purchase them on Google Play, mm -hmm. and then ask um, Google to read that book that's on there. But they're improving it. And pretty soon, I'm pretty sure the feature is going to come with the ability to purchase. Um, for Amazon Alexa, mm -hmm. They've integrated music purchasing. My daughter accidentally purchased songs. And then I realized I should actually put the children controls on there so she can't purchase any other things. It's like, hey, do you want to put, hey, Zara, do you want to purchase um, Amazon Music to listen to Mother Goose rhymes? And she said, yes. And I was like, what? What is this charge that just showed up? <laughs> oh. So it's just kind of, it's just, so the Alexa and Amazon Echo devices have integrated Alexa voice assistant for purchasing. So it's a matter of mm -hmm. educating your readers how to exactly do it. And the first thing is having an audiobook because they prefer, they will find audiobooks mm -hmm. and then they will find audiobooks that are in the Kindle store that are borrowed from the Kindle owner's lending library. If you're part of Kindle Unlimited or, um, or if you have prime reading, then you have access to those audiobooks. And also, if you have another family member who has that audiobook, I can access it as well. So it's just making sure that your audiobook is uploaded to Audible through the various platforms or through iBooks. So actually, I did a test and I said, find me, hey Siri, on my iPhone, find me Joanna Penn's books. These books by Joanna Pence are available on Apple Books. And then it launches iBooks and it shows me all the books that you've published. And it has all your um, nonfiction books because I think all your nonfiction is published under Joanna Penn and all your fiction is published under JF Penn. But I noticed uh, a couple days ago when I updated the Kindle app, they actually had a little message in there that said, in coming weeks, you'll see a series shortcut to open your most recently read Amazon Kindle book. Mm -hmm. So they are gonna have the ability to 
teach users how to launch your book from Kindle? Right. Well, so there's a few things there. So first of all, you know, you are searching on an Apple device and it opened um, Apple Books, which makes sense, right? right? Because they want to keep you in the Apple ecosystem. And you can't actually buy books on the Kindle app or the Audible app on an iPhone. It says you can only get samples, right? Because they you, they don't have they don't want the in-app purchase right, um, right. thing to happen. So I'm wide with my books. I publish my books wide for ebook and audio book. So this is another thing for people to consider, I think. So if you're in KDP Select, you're only gonna come up if you're searching through, say, an Alexa, or if you use one of those other shortcuts. Right. Whereas if you're on Google Play, and this is why I think Google Play is increasingly important, right because of the Android dev devices and because their phones are cheaper, that's gonna give uh, better penetration over time. Yeah. Plus, I mean, we've just seen, as you and I speak, Apple has just launched a uh, credit card, which <laughs> ever, I'm just like, what the hell? And that to me is something that dents their image we need more credit cards, don't we? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm like, what? What are they doing? Why are they becoming a finance company? And it, I've been on an Apple, you know, an Apple person for like 10 years. And that is kind of difficult. But I know people who've left the ecosystem and also left the Amazon ecosystem because of kind of a protest against the domination of these companies. So it is really interesting what's happening. So I guess that's my plea for wide publishing, because if you're not on all the platforms and you then you'll only be searchable through certain assistants right so you should have an audiobook if you want to be accessible through voice search because if you're doing voice search you probably want to listen to the book and you probably mm. want to purchase the book that you'd like to listen to and also an interesting fact um i went to a podcast conference a couple weeks ago and podcasts are kind of competing and just telling good stories and sharing good stories are competing against the Hulus and they're competing against the Netflix because it's a form of entertainment and it's much quicker to actually listen to a book than to actually sit there and read it. You could do it on your commute. You could do it on your train. I see people listening. See, sometimes I see them with their, um, audio device, the little, their audible apps, you could see the, the thing working on the train. And it's nice because on the, in our trains, we don't have Wi-Fi, so you kind of need an offline experience. So you are seeing the growth of audio as entertainment. And a lot of publishers are putting certain types of contents on podcasts. The Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls, they put a lot of their audio books on podcasts. Um, we, we listen to them and we love them and it's more, it's kind of like listening to a show and mm -hmm. authors also have a unique opportunity of kind of providing that sa same experience. So that's why it's really important to have an audiobook. and there's different places. I think to get it, you could do ACX, you could do find a way voices, find a way voices actually uploads it to all the platforms. But similar to other other places like Smashwords and Draft to Digital, they do take a cut on top of that. So you could individually upload. If you do an audiobook, you should have it everywhere. So you should have it in iBooks. You should have it on Amazon in um, Kindle Unlimited. If you want it to be prioritized in Alexa, you can also have it uploaded to Google Play. So you kind of want to maximize the different places where you upload. Mm. Your yeah, just yeah. to be clear, if you're in um, Kindle Unlimited Kindle. or KDP you can't, Select, uh -huh. yeah, you can't be everywhere. Yeah. Um, but what we're, but, um, and I'm going to do a completely separate podcast on going wide. You can be in KDP Select for your ebook and go wide with your audiobook. Okay. So, yeah, there's nothing stopping people doing that. So, um, if people don't, if people want to be in Select for ebook, completely fine, but why not go wide for audio? Especially at this, I think this is a, a growth area as you know, it is a growth area. All the statistics um, show that it is. So it's interesting, uh, you mentioned podcasts there. Uh, obviously I now have two podcasts and um, my main uh, sort of way of making a podcast findable is using transcripts because they are natural language. Um, they are us speaking. So do you think that having a transcript as opposed to just bullet point show notes would make that more findable? 
I think transcripts are really good for SEO. So it would make it more findable on the web. Plus, there's a lot of new podcast companies um, evolving, or they've also launched, like there's a couple that have just gotten $100 million in funding to make podcasts more searchable. Because mm. the iPhone, Apple has the largest podcast network, but they don't really focus on discovery. And mm. I think they have one engineer dedicated to their whole podcast section. So there's other companies who are kind of leveraging the podcast success. And if you think about it, a podcast is an iPodcast, right? So they came up with the idea, but I don't know if they're going to do that much with it. They haven't really invested. So other companies are actually doing it and they're scraping data from podcasts and podcast notes. So a transcript definitely helps. Mm. Yeah, I mean, at the moment, as you say, audio is not searchable, like just right. plain audio is not searchable. Right. So you have to have some searchable way of doing it. But um, I, I find this fa th this to me all comes feeds into the AI discussion, uh, because over time, they will find some way to take our real time voices, create whatever they create, and then make it searchable. So I'm pretty sure it will come, but uh, not right now. So let's talk about your um, Barely Bear, which okay. I've seen when we met in Philadelphia, which is a smart speaker in a cuddly toy. So because you have you have kids, young kids. Um, yeah. So what is it? Why do parents like audio and voice search? So I I read a report a long time ago. Um, I like audio because it's a way to help kids learn and also improve their listening skills without staring at a screen. Uh, we minimize screens because, I mean, other people have different types of children, but my kids, when they've been on an airplane and we let them use screens on airplane and the minute we take it away from them, they get very aggressive and they become hostile. <laughs> so, but there is actually a study that I read that did say that some, for a lot of kids, the side effects is, it's like, it's like crack. And once you take it away from them, they get like really aggressive. And I was like, wow, that's just like my kids. So, and so we don't, we don't really let them, we don't let them, let them watch TV because they're still young. And uh, they're Montessori kids and they're all about like physical experience and improving your listening skills and learning through manipulatives and hands. And so at nighttime, when my children, like most children, my children are three and five and a half, one would come out and be like, I'm hungry. And the other one would be like, I need water. And I'm like, or I have to go to the bathroom. I was like, you just went, but if you want, go again. So then what I did is I actually got this little cheap speaker and I said, okay, you can listen to the Nutcracker, but you can only listen if you stay in your room. And then for my son, I said, you can listen, but you can only listen to this music while you're in your crib. And then one at one point I found that they were like hugging the speaker and I felt really, really sad. So I said, okay, maybe we should have something a little bit more loving and engaging. So that's where the idea of Barely Bear came through. And then while we were looking for stories and they don't like the traditional stories like Thumbelina or um, the traditional princess stories because they're all about saving a princess and there's always some part that's been edited. Um, I think the original Sleeping Beauty story, she woke up with child, which is a little insane. So <laughs> Those grim stories are pretty grim, to be <laughs> honest. Mean, the original are. ones. <laughs> I was like, wow, like, I don't want my daughter listening to these. So we rewrote a bunch and we um, updated them for modern times. So th you can actually listen to stories through the little Barely Bear. Which is just awesome. And what's so so in interesting, your kids were cuddling the speaker. And that's fascinating because I think it's partly this this kind of comfort of listening. And I was reflecting that I remember listening to Peter and the Wolf, the Prokofiev version with the classical music um, And w when I was young. And I guess it would have been on tape because everything it was all on tape yeah. back then, wasn't it? But you have an emotional connection to the story and they they were cuddling it, which is just, which is awesome. So what's happening with Barely Bear? Are you 
are you selling it? Are you licensing it? What's going on? Um, so we're kicking it off uh, the Kickstarter next month, actually. So on barely on barelybear.com. So stay tuned. <laughs> yeah, no, well, that's fantastic because this is, uh, you know, you're an entrepreneur and, you know, you've started lots of companies and you run your own companies and, you know, this is this is brilliant stuff. Um, and of course, then you, you will have the content for it as well. And this is the way it's going, which I think is fantastic. But um, just on for, I guess, like I said earlier, you and I, you know, being a bit older, uh, I mean, I'm not that old, in our 40s, you know, and it's kind of like how we use voice is different. So your kids, how do your kids talk to the speaker? Like, how is their use of voice search different to ours? Well, they've never done a Google search, or they've never done a mobile search. So my daughter will say, Alexa, play mother goose songs but um and then i kind of saw that translating into her com it's very command based mm -hmm. so i think a, there's a skill that you can turn on in alexa called polite mode yeah. so it <laughs> so now she has to say alexa please play mother goose songs and then mm -hmm. she has to say thank you so they're kind of just they're growing up where command prompts are the way to get access to what they need when they're listening to things. Mm -hmm. um, and I know kids, I know friends who have smart TVs and the kids just say, open Netflix and you can open, you can open Netflix. So the kids are actually, our, my kids are growing up in a totally different way. I mean, when I was growing up, that's when we introduced dial-up modems. Yeah. <laughs> like 12, 12, 1200. <laughs> remember like, them <laughs> yeah and then when the speed doubled to 2400 we thought it was like the most exciting thing ever i was like wow the speed doubled so they're kind of growing up in a completely on-demand economy which mm. um you know there's there's positives and their negatives but children are like they're going to be trained in voice search so mm. the more the ai improves the more inputs they get then the more it's going to improve so it's it's good but i prefer smart speakers because and a lot of parents I know prefer smart speakers because of the whole listening thing it makes car rides more bearable um they can listen to a story instead of you know just like watching a screen or something. Mm. oh and it's interesting you just kind of sparked something there you said they they're used to asking for what they need yes. and how I mean that's the same when we go looking for a book so we're not we might not necessarily say you know maybe some people will say what's the best vampire novel this week or something but someone else might say um you know I'm feeling really depressed with the state of politics um give me you know tell me a book uh that will make me happy for you know and escape my life for a bit you know that that need is what we meet with yeah. with fiction i think or they might go with a question um you know i've got i've got a rash on my stomach um you know tell me what that is that need to fix something so i think this is probably the big message for everyone listening is you know this is the way search is going but you need to be putting yourself in the head of the person searching Right. Which is pretty, and, and like you've been showing us testing it. I love that you've been showing us with me, obviously. But, you know, and that's the thing, people, like people listening, just give it a go and see yeah. what you say and what comes up, right? Um, that's probably the best thing. Right, so you have an awesome course on how uh, authors can do voice search and lots of other things. So tell us, uh, where can people find you? What's in the course and where's everything you do online? So you can find me on Learn Self-Publishing Fast, and we have a bunch of courses, and our newest course is our voice search optimization course and how to leverage Alexa, um, Amazon's Alexa, Google's a HomePod to actually sell books. So it's Learn Self-Publishing Fast. We have step-by-step -step videos, and then we have training exercises and materials to help you do the optimizations. And then for everyone who's listening, we'll also give you access to our SEO, our full SEO course and our Amazon keywords course as well, which are video courses. But we also have like the training packets as well that go along with those courses. Mm, so that's uh, just learnselfpublishingfast.com. Yes. 
yeah there we go fantastic and if anyone has um any questions they can find you there yes brilliant well thanks so much for your time Raul. that was great thank you